Funding for the production of Public Square provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, working to improve the lives of vulnerable children. This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I think we're in a catch-22 mm -hmm. amongst policymakers and on the ground. I think the research in the last couple decades has told us something about education that we didn't know, mm -hmm. which is understanding deeply that so much is happening before we enter a public system. We can't afford not to invest this money in those early years. I think people don't understand the connection between economic development and early childhood learning. The needs are so great because while we're not putting the money here for early childhood, we are paying it in dropouts, teen pregnancy, incarceration, all these social ills that we could be saving money. So we're being penny wise and pound foolish. We've done huge increases in funding. We haven't seen the change in the 49th. Why? We need to look at where do we need to target that money and put it in the right places. Do we need more increases? Maybe. You know, sometimes we have to sacrifice that golden cow and, and get it out of the, <laughs> you know, what, get it out of the why sanctuary. Why can't we put more into the programs we know are working? Welcome to Public Square, where civic dialogue takes center stage. It's hard for me to understand what's the obstacle for gaining the public will because I think there is consensus in our state that early learning and investing differently has to happen. We continue our in-depth discussion on how to improve child well-being in New Mexico with a look at the impact of early learning. Numerous studies indicate there are many long-term positive effects on children who attend quality preschool or pre-kindergarten programs. Those include gains in achievement and social-emotional development, less grade repetition and special education, and increased high school graduation rates. New Mexico was ranked 25th in access to pre-kindergarten programs by the National Institute for Early Education Research, and nationwide, New Mexico has been one of the most aggressive states in boosting funding for early childhood programs. But advocates say there are still big gaps, with a little over half of eligible kids here who are not in pre-kindergarten or preschool programs. Will they fall behind and stay behind? And can early childhood education improve the well-being of New Mexico's children? We'll speak with parents whose children are in pre-K or preschool, as well as school principals, advocates, and people who run early learning programs. Then we'll speak with Senators Linda Lopez and Craig Brandt, Jamie Jacobson, who supervises early childhood programs at Albuquerque Public Schools, and Patrick D. of U.S. Bank, who is working to involve the business community in early learning programs. Before we start, here's more information on our topic. Oh, yeah, go Mason, go Mason, go Mason. In early childhood education, the main job of the child is to come to school ready to play every day. And through that play, the child will pick up different uh, aspects of our world. They'll pick up spatial awareness, they'll pick up um, early physics and learning about gravity. They're going to, most of all, pick up the social, emotional aspects of the classroom and having to follow a routine that maybe they don't want to pick up right now, but they still need to do it because it's what we do in our classroom. If you're listening, please put your fingers in the sky. If you are going to put your eyes on me, please put your other hand in the sky. Now, if you are going to be a respectful listener and listen to what we have to learn today about eyeballs, please put your hands in your lap. And they also okay. have to yeah. figure out how to negotiate and problem solve with their friends. And these are all aspects of social emotional that um, they're going to have to have in order to go to kindergarten and to be ready to learn. Because when there's not very much light, your eye gets bigger, your pupil gets big. They get into this rhythm and they're able to know what's expected of them and to complete those expectations in a way that is just beautiful and amazing at the end of the year. In early education, one of the most positive things that we can do for the families and the kiddos is identify any special needs or any developmental delays that we see in the small children. 
if we can identify it early and get them supports, by the time they get into first and second grade, they don't need them anymore. They don't need those supports. But if we were to catch it maybe when they were seven or eight, they would probably need services all the way through high school to assist in those same areas. I think the underlying um, element is that we're teaching these kids to learn. We're not necessarily going to teach them their ABCs right off the bat and drill it in their head, but we are going to teach them that ABCs are important for these reasons. We're going to teach them and we're going to show them that learning is, is, is important and it's fun and it is a way to discover and grow yourself. The child feels confident in who they are and their ability to go through the world and get what they need by asking for it. Um, then they they can excel and they can then feel secure where they're at so that they can start to take the risks that it takes to learn. Well, I'm hoping that um, people will gain more clarity on how important this really is. I mean, let's face it, we are 49th. I think this is an incredibly important moment in our state. Everyone's getting on board from parents, community leaders, certainly lots of educators like myself, to really imagine that every child can be a successful learner and what are we going to do together to make that change. Well, we only have about half of the children who need pre-K currently in, in pre-K programs. And the impact is that we're losing generations of children question becomes, what are we doing in those first five years of life when brain development is at its peak to ensure that every child in New Mexico, even if you're coming from poor communities, can be successful? Thank you all for joining us on Public Square to talk about the impact of early learning. I would like to start with our, our two moms. Karina, why did you want your daughter to go to Christina Kent? Well, I think primarily I come from a Mexican-American background, and we speak Spanish at home only. So I really wanted my kids to start off in kindergarten well prepared, and especially knowing the language. I didn't want them to fall behind because they didn't know English. Her language has gotten a lot better. She's talking a lot more, and um, of course I've, I've noticed that she's learning English and uh, improving her Spanish skills, so very happy about that. What was uh, your reaction from perhaps your relatives or your friends about sending your child to preschool or even sending a child as early as three to an early learning program? Yeah, so I, I do have two daughters um, and they started preschool at three and a lot of my aunts uh, were, were questioning my decision and they were I had one aunt who told me, but they're going to go to school for 20 years, so why start now? You know, they're going to do this for such a long time. Like if she was going to be punished in a way, um, she didn't really understand how powerful it was uh, and, you know, the benefits of preschool. And Raquel, you have four kids, two of them yes. went to preschool or pre-K. Yes. And what was the impact that you saw in them? versus perhaps the kids who didn't go? You could really see a change in them. Um, with the two that didn't go, they weren't as prepared as the other two children were, uh, socially or with any of their skills or anything like that, so they were already behind. And even with the little bit of tutoring that I did do with them at home, they were still behind. My five-year-old that is now currently in kindergarten, he attended pre-K and is one of the kids that's at the top of his class. My 12-year-old son has been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, and um, he's got ADHD and a few other things. And I feel as though had I have had him in a pre-K program, the teachers that are there, they usually would be able to tell if something was going on and could refer me out to resources. So we didn't do that, um, obviously, and we just found out this year his diagnosis and stuff like that. So it's been really hard since he's been in, in a public school um, from the time he was in kindergarten to now. It's been a lot of fighting. It's been a lot of me being at um, <laughs> APS a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you also do, in your profession, um, some home visiting yes. with clients. Yes. 
Talk about um, sort of the attitude people have about the early years of kids, the people you've dealt with. Do they understand how much is going on with a kid's brain? I don't think so. I think that um, there is some education that needs to be given to parents, um, especially here in the state. There's a lot of teen parents. I am a teen parent myself. And had I have um, had some guidance and resources as to the development of children and the way their brain works and things like that, I think it would have been a lot easier. Veronica, I want to turn to you because you are the former education secretary, now head of Voices for Children. Here we have two parents accessing quality pre-K or preschool, and how common is that around the state? Well, um, it has increased significantly over the last few years. Um, back in 2005, um, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work on the Pre-K Act, and our vision at that time was that 70% of the children would be in Pre-K and the other 30% would either be at home, private pay, or, or Head Start. And when you say Pre-K, you mean like public funded Pre-K? Pre-K, exactly. Okay. And currently there are about 10,000 children and, and the need um, in pre-K. In pre-K, and the need is probably, we're just talking four-year-olds, not three-year-olds, but just four-year-olds, probably close to 18, 19,000. Mm -hmm. So we're a little over halfway for a half-day program. But I think what the research is showing that a full-day program would probably be better. So we do have a long way to go. And we have, you know, thousands of children that are, that are three-year-olds that are not getting services um, because they can't afford it. You mm -hmm. know, the cost of childcare uh, can run up to 25000 a year. The consequences of that is um, children probably not reading by third grade. What happens when kids aren't reading by third grade? Higher dropout rates, higher incarceration rates, higher drug and alcohol abuse, greater increases of teen pregnancy, and the cost to society and the fact that we don't have tax-paying individuals, right, but rather those that are costing more services, the costs to our state are enormous, and I think it also impacts the economy. Um, I believe that industry will come to New Mexico if we have an educated workforce, and um, it's not happening right now when we're ranking, you know, 49th in child well-being. I want to turn to our educators. I, I think some people might have the idea that we're talking about early learning or the impact of early learning that kids are going in and they're doing like finger painting and using building blocks and they think, oh, they're just playing. So what does this look like when you have good early learning? And it might include finger painting, right? It should, <laughs> it should. Okay. It should include finger painting and block building, Why is that important? I believe. It's very important because those are the tools that we as educators use to, to sneak in literacy and math skills at a very developmentally appropriate way for these young, our youngest students. And I believe that through play is how all of their cognitive abilities build mm -hmm. from this play. And so, it, but it has to be meaningful play. We're providing an environment that's very um, inviting and open for investigation. We want them to be exploring and using more tools instead of just play. And Even social though skills Social well. skills, mm -hmm. very important social skills for them and, to be building. And Anitra, you are a principal, so I'm assuming given the pre-K started in 2005 here, so you You've, it was added into an elementary school. Right, so we've had pre-K at Adobe Acres for the last four years, so I've really been able hmm. to see how the program has developed and been a part, an active part, of helping the teacher in the classroom build her program. And so as they're talking about play in the classroom, the teachers are really looking at essential indicators and how are we meeting the needs of those students and changing their curriculum to help support individual students. Are you seeing a difference now that they are getting pre-K? as they enter kindergarten? We do see the students more prepared for the kindergarten classrooms. So as they enter the classrooms, the students are no longer learning how to hold a pencil. They already know how to do that. They're writing their names. They know how to sit at the tables and, and know how to be students, mm -hmm. and they're ready to learn. And Joy, I know you are uh, president of the Early Child Care mm -hmm. Association, and you run a center. Now, some of the uh, parents who are accessing um, pre-early learning programs are getting mm -hmm. subsidies from the state. Yes. That gives them access to programs that they might never have access to, but that's also a challenge in the way it's implemented um, for them and for centers such as yours. Why is that? Right. The, the first, I think, dynamic that has been a little bit challenging is if a parent doesn't qualify, but there's still a need of care. And so 
they might not be a low enough income, but they're not a high enough income to be able to, to pay for the care that their student needs. And then once they are approved for the state subsidy, uh, they receive a contract. And a contract is a limited amount of time that they're approved. And it might be while they're going to school. It might be while they're looking for a job. And, or it might be while they're at a lower income scale. And so then it poses a little bit of a, a conflict in a school setting because if a parent gets a raise, mm -hmm. then they have now lost that contract, mm -hmm. but their raise isn't enough to pay for the school that they're sending their child to as a private paid parent. And so then now that child has to move schools or the parent has to figure out what to do because they no longer have that contract. So the contract's like a month? Um, some of the contracts are a month, some of them are a couple weeks, some of them are three months. Just depending on the need of the family is what they're approved for. Mm -hmm. If someone's a college student, they're approved for the time that they're in class. So that's a little disruptive for the family and for the centers. It's very hard to have sustainability. Mm -hmm. Viewers know that there are about 20,000 kids that are served at about 150% of poverty. So for a family of four, mm -hmm. that's 35,000 a year. And everyone from 150 to 200 percent of poverty that are making a little bit more than that go on a waiting list. Right. And so it, it's very difficult for them to be able to make ends meet. And then these children oftentimes wind up in substandard kinds of situations mm -hmm. because the parents cannot afford it. We used to be at 200 percent. We used to be at 200 percent of poverty. Recession. And we would like to see us be at 200 percent of poverty. I recently just came back from a conference where there were programs in Michigan where they were funding up to 300 percent of poverty mm -hmm. just wow. because they recognize the importance of early learning and care. Mm. But you know that's something that we want to push again for this next legislative session to mm -hmm. see that bumped up to 200 percent of poverty. And these are for three-year-olds generally? This is for three-year-olds in, in child care programs. Okay, so, mm -hmm. who are getting early learning in child mm -hmm. care programs in preschool. Mm -hmm. Okay, and also I know the reimbursement rates for private providers don't probably don't cover all the costs. <laughs> well right now um, the highest paid provider is covered at 75% of market rate. And so even if you are the highest considered quality, the highest paid provider, mm -hmm. the best standard of care, you are still not receiving mm -hmm. a reimbursement rate that covers the cost that it takes to implement that quality. Mm -hmm. Lois, there's, this is a mixed bag, but there's still a lot of needs. So should we be pessimistic, optimistic? New Mexico has a vision of what's possible for every child. And um, it's, um, right now we have this infusion of race to the top funding that's allowing us to act in ways that bring resources together from our Office of Child Development at CYFD, our Department of Health that serves um, families with young children, PED that um, has an interest in young children coming into the schools. So New Mexico is, is poised to try to um, join efforts across those three major agencies, let alone all of us on the ground that serve young children and their families, to try to um, offset the realities of poverty in our state. This new push mm -hmm. through Race to the Top, where we're building capacity, um, carries with it a new philosophy um, that I think really resonates with what we heard from parents at the start and certainly what providers and other educators are saying. And that philosophy is that every child is an engaged learner. So New Mexico yeah. now is trying to invest in the right stuff. But we've got to do it in a way that works on the ground. And, you know, and, and the magic between what we're trying to do and how it really works on the ground is hard, hard work. We don't have representatives from CYFT or PED here. They mm -hmm. declined to send representatives for our show. But one of the points uh, in a recent report by Kay Johnson, looking at the oh, spectrum of early yes. childhood systems in the state, I thought that we could be expanding more about pre-K and early childhood if there was better coordination around this with CYFT and PED. Mm -hmm. I think she's seeing some duplication in coordination. <laughs> and that was the intent. If you read the act, mm -hmm. it clearly says that both agencies are to work together to coordinate standards, to coordinate RFPs. Um, and I think that the, the Children's Cabinet, mm -hmm. um, 
that I would like to see more active really could help foster more of that coordination. Kate Johnson did recommend that. And that needs to happen. And uh, it was happening before, and there's no reason for it to not be happening now. What I'm really hopeful about is there is a call from our Office of Child Development that we need everybody, everybody's creative thinking, to figure out ways to do business differently. All eyes are on New Mexico right now because nobody in the country hmm. is trying to do as comprehensively um, work on behalf of home visitation, early learning, Head Start federal program, not a state program, how Head Start fits in, how all of our special education, how pre-K. And you know, someday we're going to figure out how is it a continuum from birth into elementary school, a whole big new system. I want to ask <laughs> Betty, because you work all over the state, why is early learning, getting kids in early learning programs particularly important for kids who might have special needs? The kids are, are learned, have some strengths and have some weaknesses. And sometimes we're not totally aware of what those weaknesses are until a child comes to a program where they're interacting with other children and a family realizes, mm -hmm. we need to look into this. Uh, what can we do? So that starts the special education referral process. You want every child to have these uh, foundational skills, and usually a child with a delay is missing one of those foundational so skills. So the earlier you catch it, the more um, success you might have. The, the more a child has a chance of, of starting to build those skills so that the next level of skills are accessible to them. Mm -hmm. And I think the therapists and all are building the strategies for the kids as they're working with them. So yeah, the earlier, the better. And um, the more that uh, we accept these weaknesses and strengths in, in people and all work together again to, to build acceptance for everyone is important. Uh, Madi Sol, I wanted to turn to you because the United Way of Santa Fe made a very strategic decision some years ago to put your efforts in zero to five. Talk about that model and why you think it might offer some examples. We have a family, a first time family, who's in the first born program and they were concerned um, because their child um, was having some struggles to crawl. And so because of the first born program and having a home visitor in there, they were able to recognize that early and get a referral to a local um, agency that serves children with developmental delays. Because of that early intervention, and this all happened prior to the child's first birthday, um, the little guy got the issue addressed with support of various systems funded by Department of Health, funded by Children, Youth and Families Department, people on the ground working together, and the little guy's a confident walker now. Mm. Had that not occurred, chances are he, that wouldn't have been caught. The kiddo would have showed up to early learning. Had he you know, been delayed in walking, chances are his delay in other um, development may have occurred as well. And so that's a perfect example of, of why early intervention is so critical and, and early support, frankly. The other piece through this process, the family, who's a new, again, first time parents, they now feel confident that they can recognize and know their child and, and how he develops. Mm -hmm. And when things aren't on track for him, they know how to access resources. So they're gonna go into the, the school environment and, and they're gonna be excellent advocates for their child and they're gonna help support him so that he continues to learn. The services we provide at United Way of Santa Fe County are really to support the child and their parents. And so parent engagement, parent involvement, parent inclusion is a critical piece of every one of the programs that we offer. We're going to be expanding and it's a, it's a partnership with the Santa Fe Public School District. We will be on a new campus and, and a big component of that is also not just providing the care for the children at our center, but um, additional services that will be out in the community to try and serve those children who are who are not able to access or whose parent schedules for example don't allow them to be in a center that parents work at night or parents right. work at weekends and when those things happen children need to be cared for by families friends and neighbors 
And so we're going to be working to outreach the families, friends, and neighbors that are taking care of the children to help increase the quality and just provide them support and, and materials to help them increase the quality of services they're providing in the homes. So I'm curious if you all think that pre-K should be universally available. If we agree with that, then how do we make that happen? <laughs> well, it, and I think that was the intent when we looked at a 70% take-up rate to fund mm -hmm. to that level, knowing that that other 30% would probably be either in Head Start programs, uh, in home, uh, because some parents just choose to do that because we have homeschooled parents, homeschooling parents now, uh, or private pay for whatever reasons. We're a little over halfway there. It is doable. What we have to set our sights on is can we make this a full day program, which we think would make a big difference. Just one thing that Marisol said mm -hmm. that I think is so important that we haven't talked about, and that is support for the, for the family. And it helps minimize adverse childhood experiences that then creates toxic stress and affects cognitive development, brain development. So if mom has postpartum depression and we can get her connected with behavioral health or there's domestic violence in the home or there's alcohol or drug abuse, when there is this kind of support and empowerment for parents and families where they can access social services, we can help mitigate that toxic stress that makes it difficult for children to learn long term. And I think another important piece when we're talking about early learning, we hear early learning and we think of classrooms right away, mm -hmm. but what we do mm -hmm. in the schools and what we're doing in the programs is so much more than that. Our students are coming to school and they're eating, eating a healthy meal. Mm -hmm. Which, might, which is big for some of our families. Um, so it's, they're being fed in these programs. We're working with the community, we're working with parents, providing uh, parent workshops, bringing them into the classroom and teaching them about early learning and what you could do in the home. And so the parent involvement in the com community piece is huge, especially I know in my school and a lot of the schools in the, the Albuquerque Public School District doing the New Mexico pre-K. And then our school in New Mexico pre-K, um, a big component of our program is a family engagement plan. Mm -hmm. okay. So we build that into oh, our program. I mean, and we do work with families on a daily basis because they do have to come in and sign their child in and out. So we do see the families every day. We also do home visits at the beginning of our year. Hmm. So we do okay. go into every child's home. We get to meet the family. We meet the student. We get to kind of get a, you know, an idea of you know, where we're starting. And then we also work with them throughout the year as well. And I think the spirit of this discussion is that we're trying to reframe thinking about young children and families from a family point of view. Our communities and our state is not organized from a child and family-centered perspective. And yet, there's no way we're ever going to have the citizenship or the workforce, if you're looking at the long picture, without getting right back to what are we doing well on behalf of our children and families. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, many of us as advocates are, are, you know, the voice that we use is to say we want every policy measured against, is this in the best interest of children and families? Well, we will pick that up on the second part when we add in our leadership. <laughs> Thank you for coming back for our second part of Public Square. We've added in some of our leadership folks. I wanted to turn to our two senators. I know you were watching out in our green room. If there was anything in particular you heard in the conversation that you wanted to comment on? I thought it was really uh, interesting and, and really liked what you were saying about the parents being the first educators. You know, from the, the day my uh, three children and from the day they were born, you know, we brought them home. We started reading to them. We started working with them. Uh, my mother was a preschool teacher. So, you know, we taught them their colors. We taught them how to count to 10. We taught them their ABCs before they ever went to a preschool. I think that's great, but I think some of our folks might say, that might not be common among all parents, right? <laughs> and I think, I think a conversation we were having kind of between ourselves also was how do you make that connection so it doesn't just fall on waiting to go to a, a pre-K program, an even start program. How do we build that as a state to have the responsibility of the parents carry all the way through? Because we see the gap and although we try to, to begin to help students and parents as they enter the programs, there's a gap, unfortunately, already, That's and you one see of the it at three. Things that I feel like preschool 
provides to parents often. I think there's a lot of parents who don't know to do those things. I think government plays a role, faith-based plays a role, community centers plays a role, grandparents, business. But I think all of us as a state creating an awareness that brain development and learning begins at birth and even prenatally in terms of the mother having good prenatal care. We have come a long way. Now it's just getting together the political will to fund to the level that we need. Mm -hmm. And we've seen increased funding every year. We're still not at sort of a universal level, and there's an argument that some argue we have fewer resources, we need to target them to high risk, to those in need. There's another thought that we should make these more universally available. Mm -hmm. Let's find the political will to fund at that level. And I think you'll find that there's consensus that we do need and should be focusing on early childhood. But the devil is in the details. There's still more discussions to be had as to how we fund this. Senator Padilla will be carrying the bill this year to tap the land grant permanent fund. Is that something that you all will look at? Do you know? I won't support going any deeper than what we do now. I think that it's not always about money. Uh, it's about how do we, you know, why aren't, why aren't we talking to parents as soon as they have their children? Why aren't we, you know, helping them understand Oh, but you that know, takes money. <laughs> <laughs> there's programs there, and the United Way in Santa Fe is doing a lot of that. And you know, why aren't we, you know, working with them more to make sure that parents are carrying out their responsibility? Well, at you're home. doing that by raising money, right? We add on to what we get from the state in order to provide a quality service. Right. But I, I have a, a really neat story about home visiting, and home visiting is a very cost-effective way to help address a lot of these longer term issues. The sooner we get in, and, and, and when it's universal, the stigma around it goes down. So it's not just, oh, I'm a high risk family. Hmm. I'm a human being who just had a child. And that's new, I mean, that's a universal experience for all human beings. And in one, this wasn't a story from my program, but I loved it. There was a, a father who was receiving home visitation services. And the home visitor was saying, you know, you need to read to your child. It's really important. Well, the fellow didn't know how to read. But the one thing that he did love and he did know was trucks. And so he had a big truck that he loved to ride. And so the home visitor said, why don't you read the truck manual to your child? Because that was something he understood by the pictures. And they'd kind of go. So he started reading to his child the truck manual, because it doesn't matter what the content is. It just means that you're mm -hmm. spending the time and sharing that, that that experience. And fast forward, the child enters into Head Start a few years later, and the dad who's in there reading to the classroom? That dad who was reading his truck manual a few years ago, and that's a true story. So again, it's important that we, we see, you know, not everyone has a preschool teacher um, as a mother, but some people have trucks, and some people have other things. And so how do we mm -hmm accommodate and support that and empower families because there's not a parent that doesn't want great for their child. They just don't know sometimes. And our, our society is not just a traditional parent anymore. And I know I heard that in the conversation. Yes. There are single parents such as myself. Many of our families don't have grandmas, um, you know, grandpas, aunts, uncles and such to go home with them to help them because our society has changed so much. I'm so. sensing you would be in favor of more money oh, yes, from yes, the yes, land yes. grant back fund. To the money okay, question. I just wanted to clarify. Yes. <laughs> yes. So yes. Yeah, I just want to jump in to say I think we're in a catch-22 right. amongst policymakers yes. and on the ground. I think the research in the last couple decades has told us something about education that we didn't know, mm -hmm. which is understanding deeply that so much is happening before we enter a public system. Somehow, we've, our dollars flow down so that by the time at early learning, last I knew we were about 2% 2, 2 of the state budget. Right. We've, to me, we've got to flip that on its head. But how do we right. ensure every parent has access to what high quality you, uh, means? You bring up the return on them. investment argument that economists yeah. have made. By oh, investing yeah. more early on, you get yeah. a higher yes. return. And, and Pat, that seems to be resonating with business people. We can't afford not to invest this money in those early years because there is a, a proven rate of return. A number of economists have studied this and shown that that's our best place to, to spend money is to get these families and these children off to a good start. And if we do that, then the cost down the road of education intervention, uh, the criminal justice system, all of the bad things that happen when our kids are not educated 
we, we save enough money that we've more than paid for what we invested on what, the front you're, end. You're gathering a group of business people together sort of to look at this. So I'm going to have a group of a dozen or so business leaders uh, into my office uh, next week, uh, try to bring them up to speed on how important this is and start the dialogue. And these are people who can get things done. Of the 20 plus kids that I've tutored over the years, mm -hmm. three-fourths of them come to the classroom with little or no literacy skills. Right. You know, whether we fund it from the permanent fund or the general fund, I'm not sure what the best solution is, but we need to fund it. Well, I think it's interesting, you know, in the show we ran last month, someone made the point that we were very ready to give $500 million to Tesla to try and get them to come here, but that would never, that right now, if you offered that amount up for early childhood, I don't think you'd get the same people on board. Well, I, I think people don't understand the connection between economic development and early childhood learning. Mm -hmm. It's probably the wisest money we can spend early on in a, in a child's life. So we need an educated workforce to attract, um, you know, higher wage paying jobs, but in the short run, we're also creating jobs by having more programs. Supporting those programs that are already established. There are so many preschools statewide that mm -hmm. provide quality care. Mm -hmm. I mean, they provide quality care there. It's economic stability. They provide jobs. and Well, it also so allows parents to work. It allows parents right. to work. Right. And so maybe, you know, sometimes I've, I've heard a couple times creating new programs, creating new programs. Well, one of my challenges to the legislators and to the state is to support the existing programs. Mm -hmm. There seems Maybe. to be a need for better agency coordination. Mm -hmm. on well, and that's where And I'm we don't, as again, PED and CYFD are, are not with us. They decline to send right. folks, so we can't ask them. But, <laughs> but I, think, I, think, I think quality is built from the ground up. It's not all about creating state-run programs. I, I mean, I really agree with Joy on mm -hmm. that. I think it's investing it's in what we've got and then lifting the boats of quality. Many of us in public schools, many of us in early learning programs, walk around talking about parents as what they haven't done right, mm -hmm. or if only the parents did X, Y, Z. There's an attitude toward parents that doesn't match our rhetoric around family, uh, around family authentic engagement. Mm -hmm. And until we get at that mm -hmm. crux, mm -hmm. which is a quality issue, and it's a belief about relationships, mm -hmm. and we're all in this together, we're not going to solve this problem. So, well, that's I'll, right. I'll, I'll yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So sorry to put you on no, the spot. No, it's okay. I'm glad, I'm glad you did, because I think that you're, you're absolutely right. There is a conversation that tends to be very negative because oftentimes it's what's the old adage, a few bad apples spoil the bunch. You know, in the public school setting, um, life would be a piece of cake sometimes except for those few people who come in the door threatening and angry and confronting people and that kind of thing. And I think that's, that sets pe teachers off a little bit. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that brain development starts in the womb. And we need to have students that are coming into schools to, so that we can help them be successful who have healthy brains. So as you guys added in pre-K, it seems like you probably had to do more of this parental engagement, right? A into lot APS. more. A lot more. You know, we're the, the same services that I'm hearing around the room today, um, we're wrapping into our pre-K programs. The home visitation piece has become hmm. a very important component of that. And building that trust relationship, which I think is key to those that that 30% that doesn't access service, really trying to make sure that they understand they can trust us with their, the lives of their little children, that we're gonna do the best thing for them. One of the best ways to do that is be in that home and welcome them into ours. And if there is a resistance to make sure that we open the door and say, okay, then come to us and let's, let's talk and let's open that door. Are you seeing impacts on the kids now entering kindergarten who have gone through I think we are. Um, we're st it's still a new endeavor, and I think over time we will see more and more, especially since we are approaching the curriculum for pre-K around that brain development piece and around critical thinking and creativity, problem solving. Rather than just a skill and drill rote, you know, here's your ABCs, here's your numbers, your colors, your shapes, which are all very important, it's also about how kids think about the world in which they live, how they create their own knowledge and using that whole constructivist point of view to help students 
be engaged and curious about the world around them. These are new programs that they're still kind of waiting to see if something is working, but we've seen things in private schools, private paid schools, state subsidized private preschools, that's been working for a long time. It, again, it goes back to Lois, it's, re, it's about relationships. It's about parents feeling confident to build a relationship with their child. And you know, we, you know I, I agree with you, a lot of times we say, well, these parents this, these parents that. A lot of parents didn't have the relationship or a supporting environment. Mm -hmm. um, and even families who may have means didn't, you know, maybe they were verbally abused in their homes or they were hit or, you know, whatever the case may be. And so all of those things, and again, this is why I love home visiting as a tool for early education, is because we have opportunities to have conversations with families about, you know, what is your biggest fear about being a, a, a new parent? How were you raised? Did that work for you? What are the things you want to continue? What are the things you this don't? This sounds like a, more of an argument for a more universally available Absolutely. model yes. for these Absolutely. services, and, and which I is not quite what the state's doing right now. Well, <laughs> we're getting I there. That this, yeah. I would argue we're getting that there. the state, yeah. and again, I think this is an infusion of race to the top. Money gives us This an is a federal grant, this race is to the top. We're one of 13 states mm -hmm. that the federal government has invested in because we had such a strong vision and set of goals and objectives for raising quality across systems in our state. And I'm going to tie it back to this opportunity with Reggio Emilia with the Wonder of Learning show. Mm -hmm. that's right here in the heart of Albuquerque at the Museum of Natural History. What this philosophy of learning starts with that every child is a capable learner. And that as adults, we've got to try to research and think about and observe what that child's doing to support it. So it's good educational practice. We haven't heard from our, our parents for a while and you've been listening and absorbing all this and I'm wondering if you have thoughts about, you've, been, you've had fairly positive experiences with your kids in preschool. If you think that everyone should be able to access that and why? I have a kindergartner. She just started this year. And um, I've noticed that she's very, very confident. And even with the kids that have gone to preschool, she comes home and tells me, you know, this person is so smart. And I think that, of course, that's going to affect her. It's going to go through her for the rest of her school life. And, you know, who knows for how long. But just knowing that she feels smart and able to learn. And then it makes me think about, well, what about the kids that didn't go to preschool? Do they suddenly feel like, uh, well, why don't I know this, or is there something wrong with me? Yeah. I think it's absolutely necessary that they have that same experience that my kids have had in the past. We're asking the parents to send their students to school earlier, mm -hmm. and that's the whole endeavor here. Um, but are we supporting we the educators more? Right. Not necessarily. Not necessarily, okay. Well, to keep them in childcare programs after they have their degrees they're looking right. for the jobs in the school yes, systems yeah. because they can but finally make a living wage. Schools you know? are not <laughs> able to give them raises and, and maybe they're not able to support that, but it's so needed. We, you know. This seems like an important component to improving yes. our kids' learning and well-being, so how do we fix that? One of the things that we have to do for all of our teachers, pre-K to post-12, is we have to provide them ongoing professional development and we have mm -hmm. to help them to maintain their skills. You know, oftentimes teachers get out of a program and they are expected to do this enormous basket of tricks um, to create um, a learning environment to help students gain proficiency in reading and math and yet they don't have very many supports to, to help foster their own learning. And we're seeing that now with the, the programs that are going on with teacher evaluation. And they're saying, I need help to do this. And there's no money to provide that professional development for them. And I hear, I appreciate Lois's optimism that it's all <laughs> on the up and up, everything's getting better. But we've started so far behind because mm -hmm. we're, yes. we're still 49th mm -hmm. in child well being, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. according to the Kids Count yeah. survey. So we can double what we put in but you're doubling a smaller amount. So I'm just curious, maybe I'll ask our legislators, 
it's how do been, we address that? That's been part of our discussion that we've had over the years, is how much more money do we put in um, based with the smaller pot of money that we have at the state level, and how do we partition it out? Um, and, and that's where I come in with the political will, that if we say and we commit and say um, in many different ways that education is so important, then we really need to focus where our monies go. Um, what but do you think about this coming session, Senator Lopez? Um, this coming session, you know, we, we do have an extra pot of money, you know, coming in from oil and gas that's sitting there, and where do we partition and where do we put that out? But we still have to, with new legislators mm -hmm. that continuously come in, how we educate the policy <laughs> I think she's pointing too. to you, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> he's, he's one of our, our newer members in the Senate, and no disrespect. Oh, but, you know, we have new House members that will be coming in the House of Representatives this That's January. That's true. Well, so it's a continuum so education of our folks, for too. Political will? For us that mm -hmm. don't know how to think legislatively, and probably <laughs> very well from a policy lens, it, it's hard for me to understand what's the obstacle mm -hmm. for gaining the pu public will because I think there is consensus in our state that early learning and investing differently has to happen. So what's the obstacle from, and this is what business do you think, too. Senator what, I mean, what's in, what's in the way? I think part of the issue has been, you know, whether or not we're, we're seeing quality uh, in, in the preschool program. The Legislative Finance Committee did some, some studies that showed that we're not getting the bang for our buck that we should be getting. Some of us are a little hesitant to put a lot more money in when we're already not seeing a good return mm -hmm. for the money that we're putting in. But we so know that there are, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, we know absolutely. that there are, we have some programs that are showing really good results. So is it, does the political will come down to like, we might have to say no to some programs that aren't producing? Or I, I is think it that may be a large part of it is, is making sure we're putting the money in the right places. And I think that's it through all of the education, mm -hmm. not just early education, but all the way through our colleges, is making sure that the investment that we're making, the taxpayer dollars, are going to the quality programs. And, make, and, and you know, sometimes we have to sacrifice that golden cow and, and get, it out, of the, <laughs> you know, what, get it out of the Why can't sanctuary. we put more into the programs we know are working? Yeah. Because I think there's always a disagreement. There may be, you know, someone says, well, that was a program that, you know, I did. Or, you know, in our church well, it was always, you know, that was the program Aunt, Aunt Millie started. Oh, well, uh, you know, and, and we, we can't But some of that, them have, you know, do have good, absolutely. like, statistical outcomes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, like, even if I, I may, if I, I may share. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie's been itching to talk. I've been <laughs> itching to say this. You know, and, and this affects pre-K. It affects our elementary, our mids, our highs, and our post twelves. As a curriculum person, to be able to run a good program and to support my teachers, I've got to have materials mm -hmm. that they can use, that are meaningful, that are useful, that um, are readily available. And right now, the state of New Mexico does not fund us for instructional materials to a level that works. To give you an example, this year, the Albuquerque Public Schools pur purchased a math program for their elementary schools. To to do the adoption the way the state has given us the guidelines, we should be adopting for elementary, mid, and high, and our pre-Ks, all at the same time in terms of math. You gave us $5 million to do that. Mm -hmm. That did not even cover the co cost of our elementary math program. We needed $12 million to be able to provide math adoption materials pre-K to post-12. It will take us three to four years to do that, and by that time, we will have seen a language arts adoption go by, we will have seen a science and social studies adoption go by, and we will still be purchasing math materials. That's unacceptable to me. And it, and it even adds to it if you're looking at bilingual school with, with dual language programs. I'm looking at trying to support programs that are both in English mm -hmm. and Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I need double materials for those right. students. Which I think looks at I mean, why we have to look at alternative funding sources. The demands are so great. Uh, I think the estimated need is between 300 and 400 million to be able to fund a quality early childhood program in our state. When I talk early childhood, I'm talking birth. The needs are so great. The poverty is so high. We are in a dire situation. If we're talking about protecting the future, the future is going down the tubes. 
because while we're not putting the money here for early childhood, we are paying it in dropouts, teen pregnancy, incarceration, all these social ills that we could be saving money. So we're being penny wise and pound foolish. Well, I do want to play devil's advocate for a minute mm -hmm. because Pat knows I was a business reporter before I came here. And I've heard this in the business community and I've also heard it among some legislators saying, we are spending at least half our budget on education. It's like we spent all this money and we stole these crappy outcomes. So how do you, how do you deal with that argument? Well, well first of all, we, we have some great outcomes. Okay. And we need to make right. those more public and for people to know. They're not crappy outcomes. Mm -hmm. They need to be marketed. And, they need to be not shown. Being measured. Outcomes are not, have not been measured. Yeah. It's not rocket science what we've learned from those long-term studies nationally that economists looked at. It's exactly what we've been talking about here. High quality experiences, lots of play that is scaffolded toward the scientific thinking of a three-year-old. Um, it's parent engagement. It's understanding that the community services for poor kids will get in the way if they're not being met in some way, the nutrition, the health. And no matter what we're doing with industry coming in for big business for some employment, we haven't tackled that New Mexico is poor. And the way out of poverty is education. And for our kids to benefit from the educational system, I think we were just saying they need this early start. We, a, mm -hmm. a test score is only one measurement. What we have to look at is that interaction, that engagement, the confidence building, the ability for kids to self-regulate and to be critical, important, functioning, successful members of a society, those are successful things too. They need to be able to play. They need to be able to collaborate and to be able to have discourse. They need to be able to be good ex um, ethical and moral members of a society. I think they have to do that. and. We've got to look at the way we educate them. They're, if students aren't learning the way we teach, then we have to teach them the way they learn. To Senator Brandt, you've listened to, oh, very patiently to all of this. We're still 49th, so how long can we wait until we're not 49th? What would you like to see happen in this legislative session? What do you think you could do? Well, I think it is, it's important <laughs> to continue the emphasis in education. We need to take the successes in our state and bring them out. As far as funding goes, mm -hmm. you know, um, we've done huge increases in funding. We haven't seen the change in the 49th. Why? We need to look at where do we need to target that money and put it in the right places. Do we need more increases? Maybe. For, I think Veronica would be with a real case. Well, I, well, let me just point out that part of the 49th ranking is in numbers of children enrolled in pre-K. So if we want to change those numbers, one easy one way is to get more of our kids in pre-K because that is one of the indicators that made that 49th ranking. I appreciate you all taking the time to really sit and talk thoughtfully about this. Thank you so much for joining us. I think the most compelling thing that I heard today was this idea that we have to have a collaborative effort to get this work done. There isn't a single entity that can do this alone. And this initiative is so vitally important. It's a foundation of everything we do in education. And one of the, the comments that came up was, well, where do you start? Well, you start with what you can do. And that's what we're trying to do with the pre-K initiative. And is it enough? No, it's not enough. There's plenty that needs to be done. But if we're working together and we're collaborating and building a program where the supports can come and really support that child and that family and build that relationship, I think that that's where the success is going to be found. Well, the, the group that we're trying to organize are dynamic, committed business leaders. I hope to come away uh, with them having a better understanding of the issue, the importance of properly funding it, and then get them to think about how they can have an impact on that, both within their own companies, but more importantly, in the community at large. It's a no-brainer for a lot of people. It just needs to happen. Some way or another, it needs to happen, or the house will crumble.
And that's what we're seeing in society is kids who are heading into jail, who are not able to stay in school, who are making really bad decisions. And if we had turned left when we could have turned right with them, how different their lives would have been. And we have an opportunity to, to do that with this particular initiative. I think everyone needs to join hands and really get on it together if we're going to do that successfully. Join us for Public Square each month and visit our website by going to NewMexicoPBS.org and clicking on Local Productions. Here you can join the conversation, give us feedback, or suggest topics. Also, look for us on Facebook and Twitter by searching for Public Square. Thank you for watching.